Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at the two Grand Cathay factions coming with Total War Warhammer 3. The northern provinces led by Miao Ying, and the western provinces led by Zhao Ming. While there are differences between the two, I don't think they warrant two separate videos, since there is also a lot of overlap. In fact, it's mostly overlap. Timestamps below will help you skip around to see what you most want to, and if you like what you see, don't hesitate to use the link in the description down below to grab the game if you want to support the channel as you buy. Now. With no more time to waste, let's begin with the opening cinematic and Miao Ying's map flyover before we shift gears to Zhao Ming and then Cathay's mechanics as a whole. Grand Cathay, a vast empire to the east, ruled by powerful creatures, dragons, who can inhabit human form. You are gravely mistaken. We have no interest in a mere god's power. No interest in power to use against the forces of chaos? I am Yao Yi, the Storm Dragon, older than the gods themselves. You are here for a greater purpose. This map shows the energy of all things. There should be harmony, but the world is unbalanced. My younger sister, Shen Tzu, bringer of light and hope. She ventured beyond the Norskan mountains, but was lost. Without her, without her light, darkness prevails, and our family has no comfort. Though I feel your loss, the Tome of Fates provides no insight to your sister's whereabouts. Ursa knows he witnessed her fate. Then why does he not tell you? Iron Dragon, there is mistrust between dragons and gods. If we save Ursa, he will tell us how to find Shen Tzu. Let me serve you, mighty dragons. I can reach Ursa. Lead you to him before it's too late. For one drop of his blood. Your destiny is to guide us. The armies of Cathay must breach the Maelstrom and march into chaos. Balance will be restored to the world when Shen Tzu is returned to you. Our goal is clear. To find the lost sister, we must hear the God Bear's testament before he passes into myth. I am the anointed guardian of the Great Bastion. Any breach brings great dishonor upon me, so prove your worth, mortal. Yes, great matriarch. There is indeed a rupture in the great bastion. The forces of Tsinch invade through the ruins of the Snake Gate and have taken the terracotta graveyard. Further along, the bastion remains under threat from the Changer's forces, or as you know him, the dread power, Qianqi. Yet, despite the enemy assaults, there remain brave defenders ever loyal to you. Bolster them, and they will gladly confederate with a revered dragon. You will need such allies, for it is on the other side of the wall where the threat is strongest. The eternal siege continues, for the dark powers are never sated. And there, the orchestrator of this woe, Kairos Fateweaver. Face this demonic oracle, lest he bring down the Bastion. Fateweaver is insidious, and the invasion is only part of his plan. Rebellion festers in Nanyang's minds under the Changer's malign influence. Punishment must be swift to reinforce your authority. Before we can hope to take the fight into the Chaos Realms themselves, 
we must bring harmony back to Grand Cathay. There is much to do. Miao Ying's starting situation. Miao Ying starts at the northernmost extensive Cathay, with the capital of Gunpowder Road, Nan Gao, under her control. Her army has some anti-large armor piercing with the Celestial Guard, and has some ranged armor piercing with the Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen, with the Sky Junk providing some utility and artillery support too. After eliminating the initial enemy army, she'll want to quickly secure Gunpowder Road, taking the mines of Nanyang, which curiously has no mines, and then also taking Nanli further south, uh, further west, further down. The map's kind of funky, folks. It's down, but down means west here. This is, this is Nanli. Before Nanli, though, Terracotta Graveyard might be a viable target for conquest to prevent the further spread of Zinch corruption. The Snake Gate will need to be secured to prevent further incursions too, since a ruined gate like this will allow enemy armies through without issue, but a repaired one will force a siege or assault. We'll touch more on this in a bit. Nangao is corruption-free to start, and it can provide the ninth wall landmark building eventually, but for starters, you'll want to pursue the clay pit for the money it generates, and you can trade as Cathay, so it'll help you make more money through trade too. Alternatively, you might want to pursue the Labor Conscription Bureau right away to reduce all other construction costs while also bringing harmony to the faction, another aspect we'll touch on later. There are other options here too, but if you're going to pick one, make sure it's a Yang-leaning building for that aforementioned push towards harmony. Again, the Labor Conscription Bureau just makes buildings cheaper, which is why it isn't a terrible idea unless you want to get a start with cavalry. With extra ammo for missile units and a 50% reduction in upkeep costs for missile infantry, however, I don't think Miao Ying is in much of a rush for cavalry. They're helpful auxiliary forces, but I felt as though they could wait, to be honest. Something to keep an eye on at all times is diplomacy. Not only for potential trade agreements, but also because Confederation never seems to be too far away as Cathay. Some factions are more obstinate about their independence than others, but the Celestial Loyalists are often easy pickings for Confederation pretty early on. Now on the topic of other Cathay factions, let's turn our attention to Dao Ming, starting with his campaign flyover. My sister assumes it is her right to hear the Bear God's testament. But you will help me reach Ursun first. I will guide you to the Dying God. You require a Grand Legion, and for that your traditional lands must be tamed. Rat men have always infested the Warpstone Desert, but the God's roar has emboldened them. Destroy these Clan Eshin pests. Further north, your absence from Shangyang has left a power vacuum that rebels have now filled. The insolence. They must suffer the dragon's wrath. Once the desert is yours, the Tower of Ashshare shall come under your dominion. The caravan routes under its control will give you the riches required for the dread expedition into the Chaos Realm. Beware the Great Maw, for the ogres mistake this pit for a god. Yet even further south, you shall find more enemies eager to invade. Disharmony blights Grand Cathay, mighty Zhao Ming. If you are to find Ursin, you must restore the balance. Only then will the Dragon Emperor look upon you with fondness. Praise be to the Iron Wind! Dao Ming's starting situation. Dao Ming starts with some Skaven to deal with to his north, with his own start being to the far south, which feels like far east on the map, and with Hanyu Port, the provincial capital of the wastelands of Jinshen, under his control. His army lacks the higher tier melee infantry or ranged components of his sister, but he makes up for them with airborne cavalry and the artillery from the Fire Rain Rocket. The City of Monkeys and Shen Wu would take him north to fully conquer the wastelands of Jinshen, but to his south are the Blue Viper Greenskins. Farther south, and to his west, lie Ogre Kingdoms and the Great Maw itself. Hanyu Port is off to a decent start as far as recruitment options are and will be concerned for the near future, since Zhao Ming sees a reduction in upkeep costs for melee units. With that said, you should consider Yin-leaning buildings to help balance out the disharmonious start. Don't underestimate Harmony 
Harmony is one of the core Cathay mechanics, and it's not one you can be aloof about. Balancing yin and yang is a constant back and forth as each newly recruited general and each newly added hero character adds their own influence to the balance, as do your defense and infrastructure buildings. When yin and yang are equivalent, you'll get the insane bonuses that you see listed on screen here, as well as access to the Ancestral Warrior's army ability for all your armies, a summoned unit that can tip the balance of a battle in your favor, if not at least an engagement or two within said battle. I don't think I really have to explain why having a massive 20% boost to all your economic buildings is helpful, or why having a 20% reduction to construction cost can work to your favor, or why a bump to growth and control or a reduction in corruption might be helpful. Attaining harmony is of utmost importance so that you can reap all these benefits, and as you can see, leaning too heavily one way or another will slowly chip away at the diplomatic benefits, cause increased control issues, remove growth buffs, and will reduce income from buildings that are aligned to that side. So if you're heavily invested in Yang buildings and Harmony is tipping towards Yang as a result, each of those buildings is performing worse than they otherwise would. You do get extra income from buildings on the other side of the Harmony alignment, but you're much better off getting those benefits without any of the negative by sitting right in the middle. The fastest way to move to the other side is by recruiting generals. They'll each add plus three to either yin or yang depending on their leanings or their lore. Heroes only add plus one to either yin or yang and each individual building marked appropriately only adds plus one to its designated side of the balance as well. Keep in mind that yin and yang buildings are typically paired and building one locks out the other within the same city. Make sure to plan your use of slots with these pairings in mind, and remember that harmony only matters at a faction-wide level as represented up here. It doesn't matter in individual cities or provinces themselves. Technology modifies the balance as well, and the tech tree is quite elegantly designed to reflect this. Advancing down the middle, you'll see no shift to the balance, but on the upper side, you'll push towards yang, and on the lower side, you'll push towards yin. Unlike the units that are neatly split into ranged and melee categories though, the tech has no such leanings, and you'll find tech you want to use on both sides of the center line, forcing you to seek balance elsewhere. On the battlefield, yin and yang units are determined by their role in battle, with melee units being yang focused and ranged units being yin focused. When units of both types are in close proximity to each other, they benefit from their harmony buff, different for yin and yang units, and you can tell if a unit is experiencing the effects of harmony by keeping an eye on the symbol above their heads. If only one of the two halves is present, there is disharmony, but if both halves are present, there is harmony. This leads to an interesting situation at times where you have to commit ranged units to be near your melee units in order to maximize them, a risk that's often worth taking, especially for melee units. I would suggest that you keep at least a single ranged unit close enough to the action and move it where needed to overpower your enemies, or at least prevent your own troops from faltering. The Bastion Under Threat On the topic of things faltering, the Bastion, at the start of the campaign especially, is doing exactly that. No matter which of the two Cathay factions you're playing as, the Snake Gate starts raised, a giant gap through which the forces of Chaos and their worshippers can flow through into the lands of Cathay. The longer you leave this gap, the more invaders you can expect to see, and while they won't cause you too much trouble early on, you'll want to occupy the Snake Gate for yourself for a few reasons. For one, having it secured will prevent the negative impact its raised state has on the Great Bastion threat level, something we'll discuss in more depth in just a couple seconds. Apart from this, the gates, of which there are three, provide some unique opportunities as far as commandments and buildings are concerned. They each have four slots, one of which is reserved for the Bastion itself, which at level 4 gives access to the Terracotta Sentinels for recruitment, which is a lot sooner than the level 5 advanced military building that provides access to them too. Under the defensive structures, meanwhile, you can see cheaper and better quality recruitment, upkeep reduction and vision expansion, buffs to defensive supplies and ammo, and finally, buffs to growth and casualty replenishment rates to local armies. At the highest level, that last building chain buffs growth across all provinces. So holding the gates can be quite helpful. You can fall back to the gate to recruit at reduced costs or replenish more quickly, 
especially with the appropriate commandment, and with neither yin nor yang influences, you can develop these gates as you deem fit and necessary. Commandments can also help train units garrisoned here, among other benefits, and the earlier access to the Terracotta Sentinels is nothing to scoff at either. But beyond that, as mentioned earlier, is the threat to the Great Bastion, and the need to keep that in check. War bands on the other side of the wall will increase the rate at which this threat level grows, and if it maxes out, you'll see an increased aggression at the Bastion, focusing your attention, potentially distracting you from other urgent affairs. At lower difficulties, this might not be much of a problem, but at higher difficulties, you'll have multiple large stacks pushing at the gates, not just the ones you hold either. And can you really rely on your counterparts to hold their gates? Or will one of the gates give, allowing the forces of chaos through the bastion? Once the threat level maxes out, the only way to reduce it is by destroying the attacking faction completely, and as I said earlier, this can be a bit of a distraction, forcing you to return to the bastion to put up a fight. This whole mechanic is a bit of a non-issue for the western provinces early on. Until you're at the bastion, there's not much you can do about this, but of course, a war or two is all it takes for you to be at the bastion yourself, and then it becomes partly your responsibility too. You can venture out and eliminate armies belonging to these warbands to reduce the threat level periodically, preventing it from maxing out in the first place, though you can also use the Bastion Patrol Commandment to assist on that front as well. And no matter which Cathay faction you play, you can always use the Wuxing Compass to help out. The Wuxing Compass the Wuxing Compass is available to both Cathay factions right from the start, and it can be used to influence Cathay as a whole in two ways. One, by actively pointing the compass in a direction, and two, by charging up one of these bars to glean higher level benefits before pointing elsewhere, letting the bar drain slowly. Each bar only fills up to a maximum of 20 points, and once you choose a direction, you'll have to wait for a cooldown period to end before you can change the direction. When you do change the direction, the bar will start to empty at a rate of one point per turn. To the top left, you'll see a reduction in the Bastion threat level, reduced recruitment costs, and an army ability that causes a decent amount of damage in the form of a bombardment. As the bar charges up, you'll see increased defensive supplies and faster rates of casualty replenishment, as you can see on screen. To the top right is the Celestial Lake, increasing income across all buildings in Cathay by a whopping 15%, and increasing the likelihood of the winds of magic blowing stronger in Cathay 2. The more the bar fills up, the faster a growth rate you'll see. The bottom left is only active when pointed at, helping reduce corruption and enemy leadership, while also reducing the strength of the winds of magic, potentially to counter any strength it might give Chaos Invaders. At the bottom right, meanwhile, is an increase to control, and then an ability that claims to cause attrition to armies beyond the Great Bastion. You'll typically flip between the top two options, I think, reducing recruitment costs and reducing the Bastion threat level on the one hand, and helping with growth and increased income on the other. On higher difficulties, the bottom right will help maintain control so you're not dealing with rebellions at all times, and if you move quickly enough or you maintain harmony, you'll very rarely need to deal with corruption that, again, the bottom left corner will help you deal with. With the compass out of the way, let's find our way out of Cathay. Let's take a look. At the Caravans of Courage Caravans are a core Cathay mechanic that can act as an easy source of relatively constant income. You can have multiple caravans on hand, though only one can be active at a time, and each caravan master has their own traits and will further earn more traits and skills over time. They are characters in their own right, but their armies cannot be modified in the traditional way, where you recruit soldiers based on locally available buildings. Instead, You'll see events pop up from time to time as caravans go on missions, some of which will add units to the army, some of which will remove units from the army, and others which will provide various bonuses or malices or trigger a battle. In this way, caravan armies can be a bit of a mixed batch. They can have units from all sorts of factions, including the ogres. It's a good time leading caravan armies because they can be so varied and a nice change of pace when battle does come. Either way, it's a good idea to have two caravans on hand, but you don't need to recruit the second one until after the first caravan has arrived at its first ever destination when you start the game. See, there's a cooldown period as the caravan travels back to the capital, and during that cooldown, you can launch a second caravan. That's when you should try and get your second caravan hired. 
Now remember to equip these caravan masters with weapons and armors and items alike, since they'll sometimes end up in battle, and when they level up, you should consider the bottom line of skills that buff their ability to make money, either by carrying more goods to sell, or by selling said goods at a better value. Other skills help replenish the army as it travels, reducing attrition alongside it, while others still help keep the caravan safe while traveling, or otherwise make it cheaper for it to take shortcuts that might appear from time to time. Looking around the Ivory Road map, you'll see the origin of your caravans at Xiangyang, and various possible destinations. The caravan will move turn by turn from Xiangyang towards the destination you set, and selecting a destination will tell you exactly how long it's expected to take outside of events that help or hinder. At first, much of the routes will be shrouded in mystery, but over time you'll see more details including how dangerous the path might be. Allied regions or regions you've conquered won't be likely to pose any threat, but caravans traveling through dangerous territory belonging to enemies or known to have rogue armies or ogre camps might come under attack more readily. Caravans are physical entities on the map. You can see them, you can select them, and you can even attack them if you want to, though doing so doesn't really offer any benefits. I mean, you can't attack your own caravans, but you can attack caravans sent by other Cathay factions, Though again, there's no benefit, it's not like you acquire any extra loot from a caravan that you've raided. Which seems a little strange to be perfectly honest, but all that to say this, don't waste your time attacking caravans. There's no point, there's no value. Either way, as your own caravan travels, you can change its route to avoid the more dangerous paths that reveal themselves. And once the caravan arrives at its destination, you'll receive the promised return depending on how much you invested in the caravan in the first place, and you'll also likely receive a gift. Sometimes you'll get a weapon, sometimes an ancillary, but whatever it may be, you can assign it to any character where appropriate, including your generals and heroes. Sometimes, though, they're best used on a caravan, and you'll want to make sure to swap them over to caravans you're about to send out from ones that are returning home. There'll be a reduced benefit to returning to the same destination multiple times, so you'll want to switch things up and visit a few different places back to back. The rule of thumb is simple. The further the destination, the more money there is to be made. It's not a bad idea though to do a quick bit of math here. But of course, consider also that faraway destinations might offer gifts and other rewards. If you need money urgently though, stick to the known numbers and find the fastest way to make a quick buck. Look at the numbers divided by the number of turns it would take to actually acquire that amount of money and make your decisions accordingly. And keep in mind the threat levels along the way too, of course. A dead caravan isn't making you any money. And that's all there is to it, folks. Defend the wall, maintain harmony, point the compass, send out caravans, crush chaos, save the bear, and... Well, have a good time doing it all, I suppose. If you have any thoughts of your own or any questions, leave them in the comments down below and I'll answer all I can. For more strategy and Total War related news, reviews, previews, guides, let's plays, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.